history, they've been hunted and despised, worshipped and revered, and almost always feared. Now, one man has chosen to enter a world of dangerous canines to teach them, to learn from them, to become one of them. His goal, to save their lives. He is the link between hunter and hunted. He is a man among wolves. something few would dare and even fewer understand. His passion for these animals has led him to live life as a wolf. For me personally, it's cost family, home, security, financial commitment, everything is gone. But you have to believe in what you do. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I could make a difference. Sean has no formal scientific training, but for 15 years, he studied and written about wolves in Poland and America. He spent two of those years in the United States, studying with a Native American wolf expert. He's also been a wolf advisor in zoos and wildlife parks around the world. By being accepted into a wolf pack, Sean hopes to prove that man can live in harmony with wolves as long as he respects their ways. I felt by doing that, I would then be trusted enough for these guys to share their secrets with me. The same secrets now that we can use to help safeguard them and their cousins in the wild. Day in and day out, Sean puts his life on the line to be accepted as a member of the pack. At any moment, these wolves could seriously injure him, even kill him. But he spent 15 years studying wolf language and behavior, and that knowledge is what keeps him alive. Every day is a battle for survival, a harsh existence coming under nature's laws, their rules. <laughs> Sean and his pack of North American timber wolves live here, at the Coombe Martin Wildlife Park in England, about 200 miles southwest of London. This is a unique experiment. By living with these wolves, Sean hopes to gain insight into their behavior. And though he's teaching them how to survive in the wild, they're also teaching him a thing or two. I think some of the closest secrets these guys shared with me is their intricate language, the way they communicate with each other. Above all else, the respect they have for one another makes them that family unit supreme. Wolves can be vicious predators, and yet, this pack has allowed Sean to enter their world and live as one of their own. They've even accepted him in a dominant role. So how did this man become the leader of a wolf pack? The short answer is, he fit the bill. In this case, the best wolf for the job wasn't a wolf at all. It all began two years ago when a mother wolf rejected these three pups. Sean took in the orphans and became their caregiver and guide. The decision I hold with the guys at the moment is responsible for their education, their teaching, how to become wolves. But the wolves are nearly adult now, and Sean's role as leader of the pack will soon be challenged. His fear that the wolves will turn on him and shun him from the pack altogether. It's a precarious position that could turn deadly. Dinner is the riskiest time of all. At meal times, tension is high as the wolves position themselves for a share of the kill. 
Each wolf has a particular rank within the pack. During meals, one wolf may challenge another's status or be forced to defend his own. Sean must fight to defend his position as alpha male, but he also uses wolf language, a combination of snarls and grunts to dictate who eats when and from what part of the carcass. All it takes every now and again is just a little bit of a reminder just to say what he can have and what he can't have. Sean's unusual living arrangements have made him one of the wildlife park's main attractions. I thought it was quite amazing, actually. The wolves were all over him, and he was rolling around in the mud with them, and um, he seemed to be like a bit of a brother to them. Well, he is kind of a bit uh, mad. It looks like he's not in the least bit scared now, so he's obviously built up a relationship with them that, that works. And Sean's unique experiment has already attracted the attention of the international scientific community. Kyron Kunkel is a biologist who works with wild wolves in the U.S. That idea of interacting closely and observing animals at, at their own level and over a long period of time provides insights. And I think we as scientists have begun to recognize the value of that increasingly. I think it's an innovative approach and, and one that may provide some insights that we may not have considered before or really thought of, but it's also one that's uh, fraught with a little bit of difficulty in terms of extrapolating too far beyond uh, that pack of animals and uh, that situation. Chris Daramont is a wolf researcher who thinks that in Sean's case, the ends may not justify the means. I, I find it difficult to resolve that um, as humans, we can teach wolves something. I think the best uh, teachers for wolves are their parents and older siblings in, a, in their natural social environment. That all being said, I think Sean's very well intentioned. Despite his detractors and the constant threat of physical attack, Sean remains committed to improving the lives of wolves. It's part of a lifelong commitment and a passion for animals that started early in life. Inspiration for myself, I think, came largely from the people that brought me up in the beginning, um, the family, the support, and education into nature at a very, very early age, how to respect the animals that shared our world, to look after them as much as we did each other. Sean was an only child. He grew up on a remote farm with pets as companions. And early on, he was fascinated by the foxes and wild wolves in the area. Sean's passion for wolves inspired his dream of living among them. But not everyone shares his enthusiasm. Wolves are notorious killers of livestock. And this has earned them a dangerous enemy, man. The wolf once roamed the entire northern hemisphere. Over time, its habitat has been destroyed, and it's been hunted relentlessly, often by farmers protecting their livestock. Today, the entire wolf population is less than 200,000. By living with wolves, in captivity and in the wild, Sean hopes to find innovative ways to help man and wolf live in harmony. And achieving that goal requires a thorough understanding of a complex social structure, the wolf pack. Wolf families function with a strict hierarchy. Sean is the leader and holds the alpha position in his pack. This is Tamaska, the enforcer. He holds the second or beta position. And as the largest wolf, his role is to maintain order. In the wild, he would protect the pack from attack by other wolves. Matsy is the lookout. A lower-ranking wolf, he's nervous and suspicious by nature. He's always on call, ready to alert the pack when danger is near. Then there's Yana. He's aggressive and has all the makings of an alpha male. 
When his time comes, he'll compete with Sean to be leader of the pack. For now, Sean is entitled to the prime pieces of meat, the heart, kidney, and liver. The rest of the pack is allowed to feed on the carcass after he has taken what is rightfully his. But Yana is already showing signs that he's ready to challenge Sean's position as alpha male. And Sean's days as leader of the pack may be numbered. Next, their first big lesson, Howling 101. For nearly two years, wolf expert Sean Ellis has been raising and living with his three wolves, Yana, Tamaska, and Matsy. It's been an experience beyond compare, but it has come with its share of hardships. Every day is a battle for survival, a harsh existence coming under nature's laws, their rules. And this battle Sean fights alone. His family left when he began immersing himself in the world of his wolves. But now, his dedication seems to be paying off as the bonds with his new wolf family continue to deepen. These guys are like any other wild animal. They're not going to give up their secrets to anybody that they don't consider to be trustworthy. They don't consider to be family. So the belief that I had was to get in amongst these guys, trying to learn the ways of the wolf, trying to learn their many lessons that they have to teach each other. I felt by doing that, I would then be trusted enough for these guys to share their secrets with me. The same secrets now that we can use to help safeguard them and their cousins in the wild. To gain that trust, Sean is meticulous in everything he does. Every time he leaves the enclosure, he carefully prepares for his return. For Sean to be readily accepted back into the pack, he has to carry the same sense as when he left. The wolf actually sees his world through scent rather than vision. So each article of clothing I'm putting on here now contains all the scent of each pack member. Vitally important when you return that all the information, right information, gets passed back to these guys. Along with the pack's own scent, these clo this clothing actually contains all the information that surrounds their territory, where I've been, have I fed, have I made a kill. To the wolf, this is a wolf newspaper. All the information about his world comes back to him now. One thing Sean's discovered is that a wolf's sense of smell is absolutely critical to its survival. They use their news to find the animal's condition from miles away because there'll be dust particles and hair particles, maybe tick or mite infestation coming off the animal as it moves through the brush. The wolf opens up the news and brings all this information in and then processes it through their brain. So there's nothing that you can hide from a wolf. <laughs> As leader and teacher, Sean plays a dominant role. This dominance frequently leads to confrontation. Wolves constantly fight to maintain their positions within the pack, using their powerful jaws to discipline others. Human skin is delicate, especially compared to a wolf's thick pelt. For Sean, this once meant frequent trips to the hospital for stitches. But then, he made a startling discovery. The minute I entered the enclosure, the wolves would whip out the stitches, open up the wound and clean it thoroughly, and it healed in a fraction of the time. When wolves lick their wounds, the saliva can actually reduce bacterial growth and encourage healing. When they lick Sean's wounds, it could have a similar effect. 
And Sean's body, it's a lot tougher than he thought. Living the way that I do would be to most people a harsh existence that would, that would leave you susceptible to most diseases and, and illnesses, but quite the contrary, really. It's improved my immune system dramatically. I can't remember the last time I've had a cold or an upset stomach, and it's almost like nature prepares you for their world. And because of that, you tend to be able to get away with most things. Few people could survive the physical strain that Sean endures. He needs discipline, strength, and incredible stamina to maintain his position as top dog within the pack. Being an ex-Marine doesn't hurt. He trains every day, pushing his body to the limit. But the greatest obstacle for Sean was never the physical challenge of living with wolves. It was gaining acceptance as a full-fledged member of the pack. From the start, Sean knew that living a wolf's life wouldn't be easy. I think even in the early stages, I was aware that I couldn't be naive enough to think that, that a human could walk into a wolf pack and be perfectly accepted. What Sean needed was an inn, not just a window on their world, but a way to get inside. And then, two years ago, opportunity knocked. Three wolf pups were born at the wildlife park but rejected by their mother. That's when Sean stepped in as teacher and nurturer. Their names are Tamaska, Yana, and Matsi. The wolf pups are just 12 days old, but already they're demonstrating an iron grip. He's actually clamped tight on the thumb. And he, uh, because I've got hold of him, I can't actually get it apart. Even at this early age, you've, you've got tremendous jaw pressure here, and they're just starting to cut their teeth through, so he's got something to hang on to. So just literally, the more I'm trying to get it apart, he's clamping down more and more. As adults, those same powerful jaws will help bring down prey in the wild. This little wolfy love bite. Sean is about to teach the young wolves one of their first important lessons how to communicate with other wolves. These guys have just started to show the first signs of ear movement, twitching, which will indicate that they can actually hear us and our voices. So this is an ideal time now to start to begin to teach them their language. And the best place to start is with the howl. Let's see how he gets on. A young wolf howls the same way that an adult does. But since they're smaller, their calls are at a much higher pitch. I guess that's what we call first lesson over. Wolves howl to mark boundaries between rival packs. And it's essential for them to recognize the voices of each individual within their pack. In the wild, Three-week-old wolf pups can be heard howling right alongside their parents. At seven weeks, Yana, Tamaska, and Matsi are getting their first lessons in tough love. Strict discipline is the way wolves are taught in the wild, so it's time for Sean to start enforcing the rules. To anybody watching, that might seem very, very cruel, biting a young wolf on the ear to make him squeal. But the squeal is very, very important to his development because he's giving you a sound that means you've hurt him. Sean uses muzzling, or nose biting, as a form of discipline. The lesson, know your place within the pack. Biting can reinforce status and keep others in line. Understanding the rules of the pack is especially critical at mealtimes. As the pups grow, so does their trust in Sean. 
when the pups are three months old, he takes another deeper step into their world. He starts to live, sleep, and eat with his new wolf family. Essentially, he begins to live as a wolf. The pups are growing fast. Now that they're eating meat, Sean wants to give them the closest possible experience to actually feeding in the wild. So, he feeds them just as an adult wolf would, from his own mouth. The young wolves lick Sean's lips. In wolves, this triggers regurgitation. Sean will imitate the regurgitation process after a little sleight of hand. First, he hides partially cooked meat in his pocket. Then he secretly slips it into his mouth, chews it, and allows the pups to lick it out. Sean is teaching his pack, but he's also gaining valuable knowledge about wolves. Knowledge that he hopes will help save the lives of wild wolves. Biologists are already recognizing his unique contributions. I think as a parent, he's gaining some real insights into animal behavior that's hard to ascertain when you're, when you're observing from a long distance, when you're actually at a close range to an animal and able to uh, experience its behavior and its activities. There's, there's lots of information that can be gleaned. Sean's dedication to his pack seems to be paying off. But new challenges and a crisis abroad will soon test the strength of their family bonds. Coming up, wolf attack. And Sean puts his knowledge to the test. Sean Ellis's three adopted wolves, Yana, Tamaska, and Matsy, are 22 months old. They're nearly adults now, and it's time to take their education to the next level. Their first big lesson of the day, how to fish. Sean wiggles a dead fish beneath the water's surface to simulate live prey. These are North American timber wolves. So their natural diet would include migratory salmon during the fall. After multiple attempts and multiple failures, Sean takes the wolves to shallower water. Here the fish are usually close to the surface and easier to catch. The change of venue does the trick. And eventually, they learn exactly where to place themselves for the best strike. And there he goes. Successful hunt. Sean's goal is to release his pack into the American wilderness. Unfortunately, he hasn't yet been able to find a suitable location. Until then, he'll continue to try to teach them all the lessons that they'll need in the wild. The wolves are now almost in full voice. Every day, Sean encourages them to practice their howls, just as they would in the wild. Howls are a kind of long-distance communication, allowing wolves to talk to each other from as far as 10 miles away. But all howls aren't created equal. The defensive howl tells rival packs to back off. Then there's the rallying howl. It brings pack members together. And a wolf uses a locating howl to let others know its exact location. This is a defensive howl. Sean's captive wolf pack must learn how to respond to the distant howling of a rival pack. this critical skill, they could never survive. In the wild, good howling makes good neighbors. 
That's because howling marks boundaries and helps maintain sufficient distance between rival packs. This helps to avoid potential conflict over prey. There's really no way to predict how a human-trained wolf pack will respond to howling. Outside the enclosure, Sean sets up a sound system. It plays back the recorded howls of a rival pack. But will his pack respond with the appropriate defensive howl? their rivals, just as if they were raised in the wild. Sean's relieved to see that his teaching methods are working. But there's more. With this test, Sean recognizes that his wolf recordings could be a powerful tool to keep wild wolves at bay. It's meal time and Sean brings food for the wolves. But he must also share the feast, side by side with the other members of the pack. If Sean wants to live as a wolf, he'll have to eat like one. This is not really a job for the faint-hearted. And sometimes the smell can be quite overpowering. In order to maintain his dominance, Sean must eat this animal's liver. It's the most sought-after piece of the carcass, along with heart, kidney, and lungs. But there's a problem. Sean can't digest raw meat as efficiently as the rest of the pack. So he removes the liver, cooks it, then places it back inside the deer carcass. This is mine. This is what I've got to defend. Sean's diet used to be a little different. Before the wolves, my diet was pretty much the same as anybody else's diet. Fish and chips, cakes, chocolate. They used to love to have a Chinese meal and a bar of chocolate on a Saturday night along with a few beers. Absolutely lovely. But again, when you're living with these guys, it's not acceptable. You can't have that. That does you no favors whatsoever. All it does is weaken you, your scent, and your existence with them. With a freshly cooked liver hidden inside, the deer carcass is now ready for the rest of the pack. For over two years, Sean hasn't left the pack for more than a few hours at a time. Now he's just received troubling news that may force him to leave them for weeks. The news is from Poland, where Sean has studied wild wolves. The Poles have a wolf crisis. Wild wolves kill hundreds of livestock each year. And in turn, many angry farmers want to kill the wolves. But since 1998, it's been illegal to shoot wolves in Poland. As a result, the wolf population has grown dramatically. The farmers have tried guard dogs and fences with flags, anything to keep the wolves away from their livestock. But nothing has worked. The disturbing news that Sean received came in the form of a video it's from a former colleague who's a state forest administrator in Poland. Yet another calf has been killed by a pack of wild wolves. For small farmers, these continued losses could spell financial ruin. But if they retaliate, it could be devastating for the wolves. Sean believes he has the answer, the recorded wolf howls. He used them to teach his pack a lesson. Why not use them again? This time, to keep wolves at bay. Wolf expert Sean Ellis heads for America. Destination, Yellowstone National Park. 
He's here to meet with Doug Smith, a renowned wolf biologist who deals with wolf predation problems on private farms around Yellowstone. Sean thinks that Polish farmers could play back recorded wolf howls to keep wild wolves away from their livestock. He's come here to get Smith's input and guidance before he puts his new theory to the test. Being here reminds Sean of his own wolf pack back in England. They're American timber wolves, and Yellowstone is their native home. On his way to meet Smith, Sean spots a pack of wild wolves in the distance. The pack is moving down the ridge line and moving off to our left-hand side now. These wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone over 10 years ago. They're an example of what Sean is trying to achieve with his own wolves. In the wild with these wolves is where I'm going to learn all the lessons of how to be a wolf. What they learn on a daily basis, how they survive, how they interact with predators. Out there, running with the wolves in the wild, that's got to be my ultimate goal. This is absolutely amazing. The wolves have just rallied everybody together with a howl, and it's happening just in front of us. Howling is one of the keys to understanding pack behavior. But Sean thinks it could also be a tool, one that helps farmers keep wolves off their land. If farmers could understand what I'd learned from these guys and apply the different sounds that the wolves use themselves to protect one another, then why couldn't that work? Why couldn't we protect a farm or a ranch or even a town or a city by laying down the sounds of the wolf? Doug Smith was the key scientist responsible for the reintroduction of wild wolves into Yellowstone. His project has been a huge success, and wolf numbers are up. But many of the wolf packs have moved beyond the park and onto nearby farms, and now they're killing about 120 farm animals a year. We said up front to everybody they'd leave the park, and they have, and that's where the conflicts have occurred. There are now more wolves living outside the park than inside. And American farmers, like their Polish counterparts, frequently turn to the gun to solve their wolf problem. Unfortunately, scientists like Doug Smith haven't found a better solution. The people here in the United States working with this problem would probably embrace anything that was shown to work someplace, because this is such a big problem there's been a lot of work in this area here in North America, and there's been no silver bullet developed. Sean thinks farmers could use recorded howling to keep wild wolves at bay. So he's here to get Smith's expert opinion on whether it might actually work. Well, I'm very excited about the howling research. In fact, howling has not been a well-studied aspect of wolf biology. It's one of the least studied areas of wolves. And so if he can crack into uh, what one wolf is communicating to another, and if he can crack into what causes wolves to stay out of an area, um, to send that signal to a surrounding wolf pack, that has a great deal of hope. When you eat and sleep and interact with the wolves, that's something that we can't replicate here. We won't do, we can't do. And so that's an entirely different approach that combined with the wild approach may produce answers. Meeting with Doug has confirmed to me how important howling is to the wolves and just how important this defensive howl is to them. Back in 1998, Sean studied American timber wolves with tribal and spiritual leader Levi Holt. Hello, Sean. Have you sighted any yeah, wolves? The wolves are up when they're playing. Just now, Sean play. wants to meet with his former mentor to discuss his plan. Holt and his people respect the wolf and its influence on their culture. They actually observe wolf behavior and then use these observations to help solve human problems. We've learned, I believe, over the course of time that the wolf uh, is a family. Much like ours, our people learned just what it was in another society to be a family. It's something that uh, mirrors the way our people go about rearing their families. Holt believes that wolves have much to teach us about family and society. It was this belief that initially inspired Sean to explore wolf behavior from the inside. 
by living as a member of a pack. Now Sean's latest idea springs from the same source, from a deep respect for the ways of the wolf. Sean's meetings with Holt and Smith have boosted his confidence in his theory. His next stop, Europe. He heads deep into the Polish countryside near the Russian border. Here, he'll put his theory to the test. There's a lot at stake. Local farmers are still facing a difficult choice. Either they respect the wolves' protected status, risking their own livelihoods, or they shoot them. Sean is eager to meet Stanislaw Belinsky, the desperate farmer whose video of a dead calf first set these events in motion. The farmer thinks that two wolves attacked the calf. Wolves are expert hunters, and the calf would have been an easy target. More losses like this could ruin him, and like so many other farmers, his patience is wearing thin. Sean may be able to help him, but first he'll need some information, like how many wolf packs there are, and how they move in the area. This will allow him to play back the proper recordings. To track down the calf killers, Sean will draw on skills that he learned from his mentor, and skills that he learned from his pack. The sheer mass of this scat tells me this is a pack of wolves. There are two, possibly three animals here, and this is a territorial boundary marking. Now, as a pack of wolves, these guys can take down much larger prey. Gradually, the clues start to reveal the size and range of the pack. To confirm his findings, Sean will spend the night in the forest in a nearby observation tower. Wolf packs tend to be most active in early evening, and he's hoping for a sighting tonight. Sean uses a night scope to spot any activity. It's now 1.30 in the morning and the temperature's really dropping, but no wolves. It's raining on and off, it's windy, there's thunder and lightning. There's at least two wolves coming in and out of the tree line, there could be more. Sean thinks this is the wolf pack that attacked the Polish farmer's calf. There's a male, a female, and possibly two pups. Sean now has the information he needs. He knows roughly how many wolves there are, and he knows the boundary of their territory. It's time to put his plan into action. And it's important that the wolves recognize your boundary. This howling will ensure that they can get all the information at long distance. Mm -hmm. The howl needs to be directional. You can do that by use of the dish. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to bounce the sound from the speaker to the dish and then into the forest. So you need to select an area of forest and then just bounce your sound off. Okay, you ready? Uh -huh. The farmer must play the recorded rival wolf howls every day, each time he hears a pack of wolves howling in the distance. If all goes according to plan, the wolves will feel threatened by the howls, retreat back into the forest, and leave the farmer's calves untouched. Some scientists believe Sean's on the right track, but think his playback experiment needs more rigorous testing. In a few weeks, Sean will know whether this radical experiment has succeeded or failed. Next, a dangerous homecoming. Sean Ellis, a wolf expert, has just returned to England after two weeks abroad. He's waiting for news from Poland as to whether his new method of preventing wolf attacks has succeeded or failed. This is the longest that Sean has ever been away from his wolf pack. He has no idea how they'll react when he returns, or whether he'll still hold the title of alpha male. Mm. 
Sean senses that Yana has taken over the leadership role in the pack. The tension between Yana and Matsy confirms his suspicion. Yana is now the top dog. Sean's role as teacher and leader has come to an end. He must now adopt a subservient position if he wants to remain a member of the pack. The role he chooses is that of peacemaker. Here, he whimpers to calm the tension between Yana and Matsy. The thing that was going through my mind most of the time was uncertainty. What had happened? I realized when I actually left these guys that things were going to change quite dramatically. I was going to go back as a different rank than when I left them. But had I taught them enough? Had my persistence with them day and night in all weathers actually given them the value to respect me back amongst them? And if so, in what guise? The pack's first meal together, the ultimate test of acceptance. Since Sean's status has changed, it's impossible to predict how the wolves will treat him. He has never been in greater danger than he is right now, as each wolf asserts its claim on the carcass. <laughs> Tamaska prevents Sean from eating, while Yana, the top dog, claims the liver, heart, and kidneys. <laughs> Sean needs to diffuse tension around the kill. His skills as peacemaker are now put to the test. He places his body between Yana and Mansi to deflect and defuse any conflict. Eventually, Sean is allowed to have some of the leftovers. It's a far cry from his days as the alpha male. But for Sean, it's a relief just to be accepted back within the pack. You never really know how a pack of wolves are going to react to someone of their own kind going back to them after a period of time. And that was the biggest danger I had. Six weeks have passed since Sean set up an experiment to stop wild wolves from killing calves on a farm in Poland. Hello. Hi, Piotr. It's good news. Uh, yeah, the Polish farmer has had no fine. problems yeah. with wild wolves okay? since he started playing Sean's recorded wolf howls. I'm, I'm actually tremendously excited about the early results from Poland, but they are exactly that. They're an early response to what we've put into play. But it tells us we've got something that may possibly work. So what I'll be looking for now is to get scientific backing for what we're actually doing out there, to see whether we could work hand in hand with scientists, just to see whether there's a different method of containing these wolves, one that they can understand and adhere to. Before Sean's plan is adopted, it will have to be scientifically tested. From a scientific approach, it would be something that you would need to replicate. So you could do it 20 times, 30 times with 20 or 30 different wolf packs and 20 or 30 different farms. And if it, if it 90% of the time it worked, then you would have pretty good inference that the method has some uh, uh, replication. Okay, you ready? I do think the work of Sean and others who take an unorthodox uh, approach to solving these wildlife-human conflicts is of value, absolutely. And in fact, lots of progress that had been made in science over the last century and more comes from the mavericks or the people that think a little differently. Sean is determined to continue living with wolves, 
even though it cost him his family and his home. He believes that his unique experiment is making a difference by helping to save the lives of wolves. And that is what he was meant to do. Now, in this world, you can be majestic. You found your world. You found your home. Yeah, it cost me one home to get to this one. But now I found this one. And these guys, although many people refer to them as savage killer, I've come to know and love his family. Sean still dreams of living with his wolves in the wild, just as soon as he finds the right home for his pack. Until then, he'll be here with the wolves that he loves in the family that he calls his own. The line to be accepted as a member of the pack. At any moment, these wolves could seriously injure him, even kill him. But he spent 15 years studying wolf language and behavior, and that knowledge is what keeps him alive. Every day is a battle for survival, a harsh existence coming under nature's laws, their rules. <laughs> Sean and his pack of North American timber wolves live here, at the Coombe Martin Wildlife Park in England, about 200 miles southwest of London. This is a unique experiment. By living with these wolves, Sean hopes to gain insight into their behavior. And though he's teaching them how to survive in the wild, they're also teaching him a thing or two. I think some of the closest secrets these guys shared with me is their intricate language, the way they communicate with each other. Above all else, the respect they have for one another makes them that family unit supreme. Wolves can be vicious predators, and yet this pack has allowed Sean to enter their world and live as one of their own. They've even accepted him in a dominant role. So how did this man become the leader of a wolf pack? The short answer is he fit the bill. In this case, the best wolf for the job wasn't a wolf at all. It all began two years ago when a mother wolf rejected these three pups. Sean took in the orphans and became their caregiver and guide. The decision I hold with the guys at the moment is responsible for their education, their teaching, how to become wolves. But the wolves are nearly adult now, and Sean's role as leader of the pack will soon be challenged. His fear that the wolves will turn on him and shun him from the pack altogether. It's a precarious position that could turn deadly. Dinner is the riskiest time of all. At meal times, tension is high as the wolves position themselves for a share of the kill. Each wolf has a particular rank within the pack. During meals, one wolf may challenge another's status or be forced to defend his own. Sean must fight to defend his position as alpha male, but he also uses wolf language, a combination of snarls and grunts to dictate who eats when and from what part of the carcass. All it takes every now and again is just a little bit of a reminder just to say what he can have and what he can't have. Sean's unusual living arrangements have made him one of the wildlife park's main attractions. I thought it was quite amazing, actually. The wolves were all over him, and he was rolling around in the mud with them, and um, he seemed to be like a bit of a brother to them. Well, he is kind of a bit um, mad. It looks like he's not in the least bit scared now, so he's obviously built up a relationship with them that, that works. And Sean's unique experiment has already attracted the attention of the international scientific community. Kyron Kunkel is a biologist who works with wild wolves in the U.S. 
that idea of interacting closely and observing animals at, at their own level and over a long period of time provides insights. And I think we as scientists have begun to recognize the value of that increasingly. I think it's an innovative approach and, and one that may provide some insights that we may not have considered before or really thought of, but it's also one that's uh, fraught with a little bit of difficulty in terms of extrapolating too far beyond uh, that pack of animals and uh, that situation. Chris Daramont is a wolf researcher who thinks that in Sean's case, the ends may not justify the means. I, I find it difficult to resolve that um, as humans, we can teach wolves something. I think the best uh, teachers for wolves are their parents and older siblings in, a, in their natural social environment. That all being said, I think Sean's very well intentioned. Despite his detractors and the constant threat of physical wolves, throughout history, they've been hunted and despised, worshipped and revered and almost always feared. Now, one man has chosen to enter a world of dangerous canines to teach them, to learn from them, to become one of them. His goal, to save their lives. He is the link between hunter and hunted. He is a man among wolves. This is Sean Ellis. He's done something few would dare and even fewer understand. His passion for these animals has led him to live life as a wolf. For me personally, it's cost family, home, security, financial commitment, everything is gone. But you have to believe in what you do. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I could make a difference. Sean has no formal scientific training. But for 15 years, he studied and written about wolves in Poland and America. He spent two of those years in the United States, studying with a Native American wolf expert. He's also been a wolf advisor in zoos and wildlife parks around the world. By being accepted into a wolf pack, Sean hopes to prove that man can live in harmony with wolves as long as he respects their ways. I felt by doing that, I would then be trusted enough for these guys to share their secrets with me. The same secrets now that we can use to help safeguard them and their cousins in the wild. Day in and day out, Sean puts his life on it. Then there's Yana. He's aggressive and has all the makings of an alpha male. When his time comes, he'll compete with Sean to be leader of the pack. For now, Sean is entitled to the prime pieces of meat, the heart, kidney, and liver. The rest of the pack is allowed to feed on the carcass after he has taken what is rightfully his. But Yana is already showing signs that he's ready to challenge Sean's position as alpha male. And Sean's days as leader of the pack may be numbered. Next, their first big lesson, Howling 101. For nearly two years, wolf expert Sean Ellis has been raising and living with his three wolves, Yana, Tamaska, and Matsy. It's been an experience beyond compare. 
but it has come with its share of hardships. Every day is a battle for survival, a harsh existence coming under nature's laws, their rules. And this battle Sean fights alone. His family left when he began immersing himself in the world of his wolves. But now, his dedication seems to be paying off as the bonds with his new wolf family continue to deepen. These guys are like any other wild animal. They're not going to give up their secrets to anybody that they don't consider to be trustworthy. They don't consider to be family. So the belief that I had was to get in amongst these guys, trying to learn the ways of the wolf, trying to learn their many lessons that they have to teach each other. I felt by doing that, I would then be trusted enough for these guys to share their secrets with me. The same secrets now that we can use to help safeguard them and their cousins. physical attack, Sean remains committed to improving the lives of wolves. It's part of a lifelong commitment and a passion for animals that started early in life. Inspiration for myself, I think, came largely from the people that brought me up in the beginning, um, the family, the support an education into nature at a very, very early age, how to respect the animals that shared our world, to look after them as much as we did each other. Sean was an only child. He grew up on a remote farm with pets as companions. And early on, he was fascinated by the foxes and wild wolves in the area. Sean's passion for wolves inspired his dream of living among them. But not everyone shares his enthusiasm. Wolves are notorious killers of livestock, and this has earned them a dangerous enemy, man. The wolf once roamed the entire northern hemisphere. Over time, its habitat has been destroyed, and it's been hunted relentlessly, often by farmers protecting their livestock. Today, the entire wolf population is less than 200,000. By living with wolves, in captivity and in the wild, Sean hopes to find innovative ways to help man and wolf live in harmony. And achieving that goal requires a thorough understanding of a complex social structure, the wolf pack. Wolf families function with a strict hierarchy. Sean is the leader and holds the alpha position in his pack. This is Tamaska, the enforcer. He holds the second or beta position. And as the largest wolf, his role is to maintain order. In the wild, he would protect the pack from attack by other wolves. Matsy is the lookout. A lower-ranking wolf, he's nervous and suspicious by nature. He's always on call, ready to alert the pack when danger is near. 